Good morning again, everyone, and welcome to song and word and prayer at Elliott Church of Newton on this third Sunday in Lent when we continue our series of um, meditations on the Beatitudes of Jesus, which are essentially God's promises to us, and those promises are good. We also want to, before we begin, welcome a newcomer to the section leaders. Uh, we welcome back Matthew Wright in, this, in the tenor seat among the cherubs who lead us in worship uh, every Sunday uh, and inspire us as they do. Let us worship God. During the month of March, we celebrate Women's History Month. Our call to worship this morning is taken from a prayer by the mystic and nun Saint Hildegard of Bingen, who wrote in the 11th century. Please join us. Holy Spirit, sacred breath, fire of love, sweetest taste, beautiful aroma. Fill these gathered here. Holy Spirit, forgiving and giving, untying strangers, reconciling enemies, seeking the lost and enfolding us together. Fill these gathered here. Holy Spirit, bringing light into dark places, igniting praise, greatest gift, our hope and encourager. Holy Spirit of Christ, we praise you. Fill all these gathered here. Amen. And please join Monique and the section leaders and us in singing the, uh, the hymn this morning, God Love the World, the first two verses. Thank you. 
Our responsorial psalm is taken this morning from Psalm 84. How lovely is your dwelling place, O God of hosts. My soul longs, indeed it faints, for the courts of God. My heart and my flesh sing for joy to the living God. Even the sparrow finds a home, and the swallow a nest for herself, where she may lay her young next to your altars. O God of hosts, my ruler, and my God. Happy are those who live in your house, ever singing your praise, whose strength is in you, in whose hearts are set on the pilgrim way to Zion. As they pass through the thirsty valley, they find water from a spring, even pools of water for those that lose their way. Kingdom, kingdom, the kingdom. 
Our first scripture reading this morning is taken from the 18th chapter of Matthew, the parable of the unforgiving servant. For this reason, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his slaves. When he began the reckoning, one who owed him 10,000 talents was brought to him. And as he could not pay, his Lord ordered him to be sold together with his wife and children and all his possessions and payment to be made. So the slave fell on his knees before him saying, have patience with me and I will pay you everything. And out of pity for him, the Lord of that slave released him and forgave the debt. But that same slave, as he went out, came upon one of his fellow slaves who owed him a hundred denarii. And he seized him by the throat. He said, pay what you owe. Then his fellow slave fell down and pleaded with him, have patience with me and I will pay you. But he refused. Then he went and threw him into prison until he would pay the debt. When his fellow slaves saw what had happened, they were greatly distressed, and they went and reported to their Lord all that had taken place. Then his Lord summoned him and said to him, you wicked slave, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. Should you not have mercy on your fellow slave as I had mercy on you? And in his anger, his Lord handed him over to be tortured until he would pay his entire debt. So my heavenly father will also do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother or sister from your heart. Our second reading this morning is also from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 5. When Jesus saw the crowds, he went up the mountain. And after he sat down, his disciples came to him. Then he began to speak and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are the merciful, for they will receive mercy. This is the word of God for us, the people of God.
Dear friends, uh, as I did last Sunday, once again, um, I want to pose a question this morning that I don't myself have a, a clear answer to, and um, I want your help with it, actually. Uh, and the question is this, uh, what is the difference between mercy and forgiveness? Both are referred to in the parable and um, and I want to sort this out with your help. I may actually call on, on you um, if you care to uh, unmute your device and chime in when, when I uh, come to that point. But let us pray first. Oh God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts give wings to the faith in you that lies so deep within each one of us here today. Oh God, my strength and my Redeemer. Amen. Mercy begets mercy. That is one of God's promises. That's what this beatitude of Jesus says. And the parable this morning confirms that, uh, although through a negative example. Someone who owes money is, quote, forgiven the debt. Now, forgive is a manner of speaking in, in this case, because um, in the case of uh, making loans, um, that's what we say when the loan is, is canceled. Um, forgiveness is, in the case of loans, not actually applicable because there is no wrongdoing uh, when you borrow money. Um, so, is it really an act of forgiveness? Uh, it seems more like an act of mercy, which in fact uh, uh, Jesus later in the parable calls it. So the parable has, uh, has it this way, a man is mercifully relieved of a huge debt, and then he turns to another man who owes him very little money and refuses to relieve him of that debt. Jesus means by this discrepancy between the great size of the debt to the king and the little one to the servant, or slave as it's put in this translation, the difference uh, is meant to suggest uh, the way God is merciful, and that is God has no end to his, his her God's mercy compared to us human beings who can be so petty. Um, it's worth taking a minute to uh, hesitate and focus on several exaggerations that Jesus introduces into the parable um, just to make his point. Um, the first debtor owed millions of dollars, we would say. It says 10,000 talents, which according to one commentator, uh, more it's more than the tribute paid to Rome by Galilee over 15 years. So this is a astronomical sum, uh, again, um, chosen by Jesus to help make his point. The other thing that the commentator points out is that Jews did not torture in point of fact, but this was Jesus' way, again, through exaggeration of saying how grievous uh, was the man's failure to forgive and to have mercy. And of course, the context of the parable is, uh, is that it follows Peter's question about how many times we should forgive our brother or sister. And Jesus had just said, not forgive just seven times, but 70 times seven times, as God does with us. 
So this parable has to be about forgiveness, right? Well, let's not lose complete sight of the language about mercy in the parable, because it could re reveal a, another dimension in, in our wrongdoing. Because after all, it correlates perfectly, mercy does, with the beatitude about mercy, but also because the metaphor of the loan does open up a question about the difference between mercy and forgiveness. And that's where you're gonna come in in a minute. Uh, I am meditating on, are these interchangeable terms or not? Seems to me mercy is a special kind of act. Um, like forgiveness, uh, it can't be earned, but unlike forgiveness, there need be no wrongdoing involved. After all, again, a loan is not an act of, uh, borrowing is not an act of wrongdoing and no confession nor repentance or reform is involved. Mercy sounds like pure grace. Now, it reminds me of uh, that movement in the 70s or 80s, I, I'm sure you will remember it, uh, the pay it forward uh, movement in which um, if you have received a benefit from someone, um, you should extend that benefit. If not, if you can't thank the person who extended it to you in the first place by passing it forward to somebody else. The example given often is uh, of a student whose college uh, tuition may have been paid by somebody, a parent or somebody else. Um, and suppose that person dies and you can't express your thanks or repay the, the gift um, of grace. And then you in turn are to pay that uh, forward to, to somebody else. So I wondered if mercy is like, if this is an example of, of the difference between mercy and forgiveness. Um, but mercy applies only in cases, I believe, where there is absolute power exercised over another person or persons, where absolute power is exercised over another person. Think about this parable who, in which the king um, calls the debt forth, calls, the, calls in the debt of this, uh, it's, it's, it's translated correctly according to the Greek New Testament, it is slave. Many other translations use the word servant. It probably refers to someone in the king's retinue, um, but it doesn't affect the, uh, the point of Jesus' parable, although it, it it's, might raise the question, what slave has, has that much money and why would they be uh, borrowing and lending money together? So um, the king is merciful about a debt. It's, the king has absolute power. You could think of courts, uh, law courts, uh, where there sometimes is a commutation of a death sentence. And of course, the court has absolute power over a defendant. Um, there are, of course, the famous uh, cases of presidential pardons. Uh, usually, usually, traditionally, um, offered in the case of excessive uh, punishments. Um, can you think of any other examples of of, of where mercy is um, uh, applied by someone in absolute power over somebody else? I, I was I was thinking also of. You know, Henry VIII, he could have extended mercy to his wives um, and, and not committed them. Now, I'm going to put us on gallery view so I'm, I can see you. I'm serious about this. If you have, can you, think, can you help me with an example of, of where mercy is exercised? Um, and I've been thinking mainly in terms of... Um, of absolute power, but maybe there are other cases. I don't see any hands. I'm not getting any help here. I'm going to let the wheels turn for a minute. Oh, I see Ginny. Ginny, yes, come ahead. I got to unmute yourself. Oh, no. I was trying to think of examples that I knew firsthand of, of mercy and, I, and, and forgiveness. And I thought of a, 
a couple of people that have done really terrible things to me in my life. And I have long since forgiven them both, but there was no mercy involved in that because I didn't reach out to them. I did actually the one, but that if I had reached out to them and in some positive way, that would have been showing mercy, but how do they know I forgive them? <laughs> they don't. Thanks, that's great. That's an, that um, reinforces my instinct that there is a difference between mercy and forgiveness. Somebody else, are we warmed up yet? Have, has Ginny broken the ice or am I gonna fare forward alone here? No, I don't see any hands. Yes, Matthew. Uh, Elizabeth, oh. where's Matthew? Matthew is right there. Oh, thank you, Matthew. What, what is your thought? <laughs> I remember when I was in France, I, we saw a statue called the Burgers of Calais, mm -hmm. and it goes back a long time, the Hundred Years War, and um, the leading citizens of the city that I think had rebelled were going to be put to death, and um, the king's wife interceded to the king on their behalf um, because he was going to execute, I think, 10 leaders in the city and so as an act of mercy he let them live he gave them their lives that's so I guess great. Be an example of somebody who has power over somebody and then giving them freedom right and in that case i uh that would confirm my um supposition here because the the people the citizens the burghers of calais um were, were um, they had, had they done something wrong or they were just? Um... Well, it, it was a war. I think the English occupied the city in France and I, I don't remember the details, yeah. but uh, yeah. the city had been besieged and the king demanded that <coughs> people as a punishment be put to death. Great, well, that's a good example of the difference between mercy and forgiveness. They didn't have to do anything, it sounds like, to, to earn that mercy. Anybody else? Um, let's see, uh, two participants have raised their hand. I see Pat, and it could be Elizabeth Baker. Pat, go, Patrick, go ahead. Well, the, among the Irish, they often say we can forgive, but never forget. Um, but mercy, I think you're right. I think of the times you hear the expression, I throw myself on the mercy of the court. So you're looking not for forgiveness, that's, that's offered on a personal level. Mercy at, in the world that we know is given in a more institutional way. Uh, I don't think on a personal level we offer mercy, <clears throat> but we may also turn to God at times and ask for his mercy, but not, but forgiveness is something I always think of as a very personal matter. That's what we need to do because God will forgive us. We need to forgive others. Good, that's helpful too. Any, any others? Uh, Vince, uh, we'll make this the last one. Go ahead, Vince. Well, <clears throat> I've been thinking of this in terms of the movement to forgive college loans. <clears throat> um, uh, somebody recently wrote to the Globe saying, you know, we don't need to forgive all college loans. Uh, why don't you just make them dischargeable in bankruptcy the way they, they used to be? So uh, to me, you know, uh, they're, they're both sort of acts of mercy, but I think the forgiveness of all loans, uh, regardless of the financial straits of the person, is at a more institutional level, as Patrick indicates, and I do see mercy as something that's given by somebody who may not have absolute power, but who does have power over somebody else who may be victim to circumstances beyond your control. Well, that's a, that's a really helpful example because um, the bank has that power and you know what goes with that if you don't pay the loan back and they're not being asked to um, do anything uh, in particular, or no, no, you know, public service or anything. It is a free. It is free grace in that case. Um, so these are Rick. Rick yes, this is Doug Stewart. Oh, thanks, Doug. Say, if I could, if I could just break in with one 
Um, this morning on Krista Tippett's radio show <clears throat> on being, she interviewed the poet, uh, Naomi uh, Simbata, I don't know if her middle name, her last name is Nye. And she, one of her famous poems is a poem called Kindness. And when Krista Tippett asked her about that, she said this actually came from, like a lot of her poetry, from out of a personal experience. She was on her honeymoon in, I believe it was Chile, on a three month uh, travel journey. And they came across a situation where uh, they were stranded and uh, they had uh, no money and uh, didn't know what they were gonna do. And some person approached her and her husband and he was so kind in his response to their plight. He offered uh, no way out of it, but it just restored her faith in um, their situation and their ability to, uh, to get out of that, it, it, that problem. And I, I, I regard that as an act of mercy uh, from somebody who is not lording over anybody, but just a, a, a collateral uh, transfer of mercy. I believe you're absolutely right. Thanks for that, Doug, because that, that is according, that is um, consistent with the, the uh, traditions of hospitality, which is to extend um, grace, mercy, and free support to people who are in need, who are traveling in particular. So then, so we've been talking about cases where of absolute power over somebody. So now my question becomes, um, what was Jesus, uh, what was the relevance of telling the disinherited and the powerless um, uh, that if they are merciful, mercy will be shown to them? They have no kind of power uh, over anyone. Um, except that maybe maybe we do as ordinary citizens, even those who may be completely uh, powerless. Um, there's always someone in whom uh, some relationship in which we have power over others. And some examples of that very quickly, um, we have power over animals. Um, parents have power over their child. That's sometimes even absolute. Husbands and wives have power over the wife or uh, the spouses rather. And um, of course the uh, the divorce laws have changed and been liberalized, fortunately, uh, since the draconian days. Employers have power over employees. Police have power over their communities. Um, prison guards have power over their charges. The colonists had power over the indigenous, as a matter of fact. Um, so, um, in cases like that, there are so many in which people do not show mercy um, in these relationships that the laws had to be changed. Like I said, the divorce laws were liberalized, fortunately. Um, uh, supervision uh, and rules from protocols around workplaces have changed uh, by law. Um, but, but there are experiences that laws can't even reach into the private relationships. And that's where I think Jesus is directing us to those, those secret, well, private uh, interchanges between us where there is cruelty practiced. And as you remember from, from uh, divorce law, one of the um, you know, conditions, uh, criteria for permitting divorce is uh, cruelty, physical or psychological. And I think Jesus is getting at, at a very sensitive and hidden part of the human reality that we do not practice mercy um, when, it, uh, when it would be divine to do so. Um, so um, I would guess it comes down to three kinds of uh, prescriptions um, to translate mercy into human terms, into experiential terms. One, refrain from cruelty. Two, refrain from vengeance. And three, refrain from taking all the compensation that you're entitled to and that you do have a right to, like banks do or uh, landlords and so forth. And in a pandemic, how important has that actually been for so many people? Um, and hopefully that'll be extended forward. Um, 
not to be merciful is an abuse of power. To be merciful, you will be shown mercy. God's promises are good. I want to conclude just by saying that Emerson, our Ralph Waldo Emerson, um, himself captured this in, when he said, I believe that justice produces justice and injustice produces injustice. And I think that's a wonderful rephrasing of Jesus' beatitude that mercy begets mercy. Let's go and do likewise. Amen. So let's turn to a different hymn um, in the spirit of the scriptures and the message. It's uh, two verses of Lord, I want to be a Christian uh, that you have in your bulletins. Among the mercies of our lives is the opportunity to gather together and lift up in prayer the joys and concerns of our own lives. I will begin this morning by giving thanks for the witness and the work of those who met in Selma 56 years ago to march over the Edmund Pettus Bridge, who taught us about justice and mercy. Lord, we give you thanks for these saints. Amen. Rick. Elizabeth, um, could we lift up um, our dear friend David Wood, who is um, keeping vigil with his um, mother, Dorothy, who's in um, a long and slow glide home uh, with the help of hospice. David and Dorothy, please. Lord, we trust Dorothy and David to your mercy as they care for each other in this time. Be present with them. Amen. Amen. Anybody else? Ginny. I'd like to ask prayers for a former member of Elliott Church. His name is Jake Smith who has that glioblastoma and also has hospice and is now dying and his wife, Anna, and his children are keeping vigil, not all at his bedside, but thinking about him, them. Lord, we lift up Jim and all who love him to your mercy. Um, be with them as they take this last journey together comfort them and support them. Amen. Susan. Um, also prayers for uh, Martha Totten, whose husband Norm has had some health issues, but mainly her brother who had another stroke and is now at Newbridge um, and I think is failing. Uh, okay. So for Martha and her family. Lord, we lift up Stephen and the Totten family as they come to terms with Stephen's decline 
be with them, bless them, help them. Amen. Nadia. Uh, yes, good morning. Um, I am, I would like to continue praying for our dear friend Marcel, who's still dealing with throat cancer and all that entails all the treatments and not being able to eat solid food and all that, that, that he recovers quickly and, and for good. And then oh, prayers for a woman named Carol who just had a mastectomy. Um, also that, that she accepts this new situation in her life and, and for quick healing for her. Tell me her name again, Nacha. Um, it's Carol, but it's spelled, I think it's C-A-R-Y-L. I've never met her. She's okay. a friend of a friend of mine. Lord, we lift up Marcel and Carol to your healing mercy and grace. Comfort them in their distress and bring them safely through that which has happened to their bodies. Amen. I don't see any other hands up. Okay, so in the musical <clears throat> interlude that follows, I invite you to lift up the joys and concerns of your own hearts. And then I will say a concluding prayer on our behalf. Continuing in the spirit of prayer. Merciful God, you who overlooks our shortcomings and loves us all the same, today is Sabbath. This is the day to set all things aside, to not be productive, but to be focused on living fully. This is the day to come together and to be with you in heart and mind and soul. This is the day to worship you with song and word and prayer. We open our hearts to you. And we give you our cares, concerns, all that is on our hearts. Hear our prayers and guide us toward what matters. Keep us fully in tune to you and to your ways. Show us how to be the best agents of your love and mercy today and always. Merciful God, you call us to be merciful in turn. Too often, we find ourselves easily wrapped up in our own agendas. We keep tabs on the offenses of others. We judge others. We blame them for their suffering but this is not your way. As you are merciful to us, you call us to be merciful to all. Guide us in the easy times, the difficult times, and all the times in between, so that we might live grace in a graceless world and to show mercy in a world that counts mercy as weakness. Following in the steps of Jesus, we offer ourselves as your hands and your heart in a world that so desperately needs your mercy, forgiveness, 
healing and love. In your mercy, we pray these things in the name of Jesus, the Christ, who taught us to pray together as we sing. We join with Christians all around the world and all those who have gone before us to offer our gifts as Christ offered himself for us. You can find directions for giving on the Elliott website. In addition, the UCC invites us to contribute to one great hour of sharing next Sunday, March 14th. This special Lenten offering supports the disaster, refugee, and development ministries of the United Church of Christ within wider church ministries. You can find more information about it on our website. Thanks, uh, Elizabeth. And allow me to uh, jump in with two very important announcements before we go out singing our, our hymn again. And, and that has to do with the Center Street Food Pantry to which uh, uh, Elliott Church has contributed so much uh, through the Bags for Kids project. Uh, but now the pantry has started a new drive called Bubble Drive with the goal of getting hygiene products into the hands of people who need them most. Uh, the drive involves filling a Ziploc bag with five items, shampoo, soap, toothpaste, toothbrush, and dental floss. Um, Susan Nason will be the focal point for this drive, which will last until the beginning of April. Uh, there'll be more information in the newsletter the, uh, this week at TWEC, uh, but uh, communicate with Susan if you have more questions. And we do look forward to this new opportunity uh, to, to help our neighbors. And secondly, and briefly, um, just wanted to uh, let you know that we are having our second poetry night this coming Saturday from five to six, one hour um, at uh, Saturday, I guess that's March 13th, and our guest will be Matthew Sisson, a wonderful uh, poet, uh, resident of Newton, and uh, both a, uh, a teacher of poetry and a writer, a published writer of poetry. And in addition, we'll have a repeat visit from May Strochain who is planning to set a Madeline Lingle poem uh, to, to music for us and to sing it. Um, so it'll be a great night. And I just remind you, um, even those of you who say, well, um, I'm not a poet or I'm not an English major, uh, poetry in the reading and the listening and the writing of it um, is a spiritual exercise and it's worth exploring with us. So. Join in, and, but be sure and let me know so I can send you a, a Zoom invitation. So now, finally, let's get to our concluding verses, um, verses three and four of God Loved the World.
<laughs> there we are. See, this is why we're doing this. Is that better, Tom? Can you hear me? <laughs> Rick, we appear to have lost you. So while we are, are waiting for um, Rick and Monique to be found, um, let me send you with a blessing. Um, may the love of God, the peace of Christ, and the courage of the Holy Spirit be with you this day and always. Go in peace and live love with joy. I'm not sure what's going to happen with the postlude, uh, but if you would stay in the Zoom meeting here, um, go and get your cup of coffee and a snack and uh, be back in about five, 10 minutes and we'll have coffee hour with whoever is able to attend. <sighs> So what happened there? Didn't it we lost, turn off the recording. <laughs> Were you assumed?